All right, so let's get started. I wanted to share a little story before we begin, which relates to, which I found that related to um, Mary anointing Jesus at Bethany with the perfume. In Latin America, we have a coming of age ceremony called a quinceañera, and this is when a girl becomes a lady. This ceremony is a celebration of their 15th birthday, and the girl is taken down the aisle. This is me, by the way, if you haven't already um, made the connection um, many pounds ago. <laughs> so this, the girl is taken down the aisle by her father. There's flower girls, and there's something like bridesmaids as well. There is a ceremony and a reception, and it's very much like a wedding, but without the groom. It's a celebration of a girl becoming a lady. And my parents threw me a quinceanera and it's a very special and significant memory for me. Besides the beautiful dress, the cake and the loving guests, I remember being showered with gifts. And one of the gifts that still stands out to me is a Ralph Lauren perfume. I had never had an expensive perfume before and as a 15 year old, this was one of the coolest gifts I could get. It was a small bottle with turquoise blue detail, kind of like the background, my PowerPoint background. Um, and the smell was very sweet. Uh, I, I would only wear the perfume for special occasions and I tried to preserve it because I never wanted it to finish. I think it lasted me about three years, this whole perfume bottle. <laughs> In the passage that we read today, it also talks about a woman and her perfume, except her perfume was much more expensive than my Ralph Lauren gift. Her perfume was worth one year's wages. Okay, that's a salary of one year, whether it's a low income salary or, you know, a much higher one that's still a lot of money, right? Uh, some believe that Mary's family could have been wealthy and others believe that this may have been a part of her dowry gift. In Mary's culture and many cultures that still exist and practice this today, when a bride becomes engaged, her parents will give her, uh, will give expensive gifts to the groom. The more expensive the gifts given, the more valuable the woman was considered to be. Some believe that the perfume Mary anointed Jesus with could have been part of her dowry gift. We really don't know and we can only speculate based on the culture of, and the value of the perfume. From previous stories, we know a little bit about Mary and we know that she's very different from her sister Martha. So if you think back, to that story of Mary and Martha and Martha complaining, remember? Okay, we know a little bit about her. So Martha is a type A personality that is go, go, go. And Mary is that type B personality that isn't as task oriented, but more people oriented. When Jesus was over at their house, Martha cooked and complained about her sister not doing anything. Mary just sat at the feet of Jesus listening to his teaching. Mary was criticized for doing this, but Jesus defended her. What we also know about Mary is that she's more of the emotional one and Martha is more of like the thinking one. When, the, when their brother Lazarus died in the previous chapter that uh, Faith just read, they both grieved differently. That stands out for me. Martha starts talking about theology and the resurrection of the dead with Jesus, while Mary just comes running up to Jesus crying. Very different ways of processing. Some people process intellectually, right? Uh, theoretically, uh, thinking, and then others process completely emotional. And both are okay. Both are created by God. So Mary comes up to him running, crying. And you know what it's like when you see someone who's really special to you cry? Can you think about that? Think about a time when you saw somebody very special to you cry. You 
want to cry, right? <laughs> it just something gets you. And so this happened to Jesus. Remember, he's fully God, but also fully human. And so when Jesus saw her cry, he was moved and he began to cry. This is where we get the shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. <laughs> Mary is led by her emotions, her passion, and her passion. And she doesn't care who's watching or what she should be doing. She just does what she feels led to do. And I really admire this about Mary. Since Jesus was in her hometown of Bethany, after he raised Lazarus from the dead, they were all having a special meal to celebrate and honor Jesus. Other passages say that Jesus was at Simon the leper's home, probably a man that Jesus healed from leprosy. Since it was common for people in a village to know each other and probably visit with each other, Mary and Martha were there as well in Simon's home too. It says Martha was cooking for everyone and serving. This reminds me of when I grew up in my Latin church and we would get together in some of the homes of the congregants to celebrate a birthday and the house was bursting and full of basically the whole congregation. And you would have the women coming together to cook, get the meal ready on the inside. If it was a nice summer or spring day like it is today, you'd have the men outside barbecuing. And this is what I'm imagining the, the party to be like. This is kind of what's happening there. The village probably had gotten together. There's a lot of people there. So can you imagine how many people might be at in Simon the leper's home after Lazarus was just resurrected. Probably all the people that would have been at his funeral also stayed to celebrate him coming back to life at this dinner to honor Jesus. And at this party, in comes Mary. Ooh, everyone's having a good time talking, eating. Suddenly, Mary comes in and she starts pouring perfume over the feet of Jesus. The same story is told in Mark, the Gospel of Mark, and it tells us that she poured the perfume on Jesus' head as well. The smell of the sweet smelling perfume filled the home. There were probably other plans, um, you know, for the expensive perfume that Mary or her family had, but she decided to spend it on Jesus, anointing, anointing his feet and drying them with her hair. This was also another shocking act to many at the party for several reasons. First of all, she broke open her expensive perfume and used it on Jesus. Secondly, to have your hair down in that culture and not in a braid or not covered was probably looked at as very wild. So even that gesture alone was looked down upon. You would think that people would look at her with such tender admiration for worshiping at Jesus' feet, but instead she got criticism. And you know what? People will always find something to criticize. This is why we shouldn't be controlled by the opinions of others. Mary was criticized for, sent, for spending such an expensive perfume on Jesus. The disciples were the ones that criticized her. Sadly, I find that when I'm beat down by criticisms, it's usually from fellow brothers or sisters in Christ. And this is very sad. I, would har I hardly get it from non-Christians. And it shouldn't be like this in the family of Christ. One of the people who was criticizing Mary was Judas. He said, the money could have been used for the poor. But it's not because he cared for the poor, the scripture tells us, but because he was thinking he could have benefited from the sale of that perfume. He was the accountant and the keeper of the money for, for Jesus' ministry, the money that was meant for expenses and food and travel and probably purchasing items for people in need who they came across, uh, you know, visiting villages, preaching and all that. They meet a lot of people in need and I can imagine that they would be using that money for to fulfill those needs as well. All the money for the ministry was handled by Judas and he helped himself to that money. Judas criticisms 
came from a place of greed and selfishness. If you feel tempted to criticize someone, think about where the motivation is coming from. Is it out of hurt? Is it out of jealousy? Is it out of selfishness? Is it out of dislike? Or is it coming from a place where you want to use that criticism to construct that person? The good thing is that Jesus knew what was in everyone's heart and mind. Jesus knew the motivations of people's words and he defended Mary once again. He told everyone to leave her alone for she had done a beautiful thing. She had done an act of worship as she anointed him days before his burial. This story caused me to remember a time in India, and I'm sorry for sharing two stories about me in one sermon, that's not fair. <laughs> but I, these are the things that just came up as I prepared. Um, so a team from my seminary went to serve women who were transitioning out of the sex trade in Calcutta. And these women were also learning about the Christian faith. And some had experienced beautiful transformations in their lives. We were holding a retreat for them and we decided to have a spa day for the woman. And I was really honored and excited to have the opportunity to wash their feet and paint their toenails and paint their fingernails, uh, do masks and things like that. We just wanted to give them a very special treatment. And when we finished, the woman went and they filled the buckets with fresh water and invited our mission team to sit down because they wanted to do the same for us. I was almost offended because I wanted to be the one serving them. I didn't want them to feel like they had to pay me back or, um, you know, they had to do something for me, you know, in return. And I resisted and I resisted. And my team said, sit down and let them do what they feel led to do. <laughs> they are grateful. They, they, they are grateful and they just want to show it. They said to me, so let them show it. And I was touched by that action. It still gets me today when I think about it. And I thought it was so humble of them to want to give back immediately. Like we were done, their, their nail polish was dried and immediately they went and like uh, filled the buckets up with fresh water. They didn't want to be served, they wanted to serve. And this gratitude that these women showed, it reminds me of Mary. And Mary loved Jesus so much. She loved his teachings and she loved him as Messiah. She loved him for recently resurrecting her brother Lazarus and she was so grateful. She didn't just wanna be served by Jesus, she wanted to serve him back. She did an over the top thing. Gratitude is so rare, but Mary did it. She did an act of gratitude, which was considered an act of worship. And to Jesus, this was an acceptable act of worship. Here in this chapter, we have an interesting contrast between the love that Mary poured out, literally, and the hate that the Jewish leaders poured out. You know who else was at the dinner of honor, the Jewish leaders. And they began to plot the murder of not only Jesus, but also Lazarus, because they heard about Jesus' miracle of resurrecting him and people's belief in Jesus as Messiah was growing. And they wanted to put a stop to that. These religious leaders were so hypocritical. They tithed even the spices that were in their home because they wanted to be so exact in following God's laws. Yet they ignored one of the greatest laws, thou shalt not kill. They were self-righteous and justified their hypocritical actions. What a contrast. Here we have Mary's love poured out as she gives an expensive perfume to Jesus and anointed him with it. And on the other hand, we have the Jewish leaders plotting not only Jesus' death, but also Lazarus' death. Jesus knows the motives of those who criticize and bring down the worship of others. That is the work of the devil, criticism. The only time we see criticism of worship I mean to say, the only time we see Jesus being harsh was when he spoke with the religious leaders 
who even judged him. Five days ago, on Tuesday night, a 21-year-old man named Robert Baron Long killed eight people and injured one man by shooting at three massage parlors, if you haven't already heard this on the news. Six of the murdered victims were Asian descent, two were Caucasian, and the one who was injured was Hispanic. There is a debate right now going on if Long's crime was an act of racism or if it was due to his sex addiction. Why am I even mentioning this? Because Long identified himself as a Christian. He was part of a church all of his life and felt that these massage parlors were tripping him up spiritually and that he was losing his salvation. So he wanted to do something about it. He chose to shoot people he associated with his temptation so he can stop being tempted. And now eight families are at a loss and one victim which survived his injuries will forever have trauma. We grieve for the victims and the families who have experienced this loss. And we grieve with the Asian community which has experienced this hate crime. We at Church at the Mission do not condone any act of racism. We believe all people, Asian, Caucasian, Hispanic, Indigenous, African, Arab, all people are made in the image of God and all of their lives are precious to Jesus. We are to treat all people equally. We believe that white supremacy and supremacy of any person that belittles another is sin. The only one who is supreme over all is God. And even he lowers himself to our level through the humanity of Jesus. How humble is that? God himself comes down to our level. We believe that God created man and woman equal and that both are created in the image of God. This equality is to also be reflected in Christian ministry and women are not to be objectified as a sexual object that should be executed or abused when a man cannot control himself. We condemn Robert Aaron Long's acts as a Christian and just simply as a human being. His acts and beliefs of women and people of color have no place in the gospel. The Apostle Paul said in Colossians 3, since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why as though you still belong to this world do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Long was part of a church that had rules that didn't quite defend women as equals or people of color which are oppressed. And I do not want, and I do want to make it clear that although Long's church taught um, many teachings that were false, uh, they they may have been part of cultivating and validating his dehumanizing ideas, but he was ultimately responsible for his own actions. James 1.14 says, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Religious folk will have rules about all of a lot of things and will judge. This is what was happening with Mary, going back to the story and the scripture that we're talking about. This is what was happening to Mary, who felt led to give Jesus her expensive perfume to anoint him. It was a beautiful and acceptable act of worship, which was prophetic. This anointing, like Jesus said, was preparing him for his burial. But the religious folk criticized her for it 
they didn't see what she was doing as an acceptable act of worship. They judged her for how she spent the perfume and judged her for her worship. False teachings that make false rules cultivate sin to high extremes. Jesus saw that the disciples were judging Mary, and I love it. He's like, knock it off <laughs> right away. Besides Judas, we see the rest of the disciples change their approach after Jesus' resurrection. And we see that they grew out of their judginess, right? Like after the resurrection, boom, they shot up in like beautiful transformation. And we see that a lot of them, minus, you know, Judas, <laughs> grew out of their judginess. Sadly, the Pharisees didn't. This was the other group that was judging Mary. It was the disciples and the Pharisees. Um, sadly, the Pharisees didn't. And the passage ends with the Pharisees planning the murder of Lazarus, an innocent person who Jesus had just resurrected from the dead. False teaching cultivates extreme sin. Thankfully, not even Jesus could succumb to the heinous murder plans of the Pharisees because he defeated death by resurrecting from it. What can we learn from Mary's story? Jesus sees your heart when it comes to your acts of worship. Others may not agree with your style. They may not agree with your words. They may not agree with your approach. But if you are being true to how God made you and using what you have for Jesus, then that's what matters. People are always going to say something critical about you and what you do, especially if it doesn't fit in their box of normal expectations. Remember Abel in Genesis who brought all the best from the fruit of his labor and God accepted his sacrifice while his brother Cain got jealous and killed him. Remember King David who danced before the Lord out of pure joy and his wife Michal looked at him with disdain because she thought he looked undignified while he was worshiping. Remember Jesus who was so appalling to the religious leaders that his uh they schemed to murder him. Now look at Mary, who probably should have been cooking, probably should have saved her perfume, probably should have tied up her hair, but she didn't. Jesus doesn't care about our silly societal expectations because he looks at the heart and he accepted Mary's act of worship and defended it. Lastly, I just want to declare Jesus is supreme. Feel free to say that. Repeat after me. Jesus is supreme. Jesus is powerful. Jesus is loving. Jesus uses his power to defend the powerless. Thank you for repeating. We see this in how he treated Mary and accepted her act of worship, and he honored and remembered her by allowing her story to be told in the Gospels three times in total. Jesus isn't racist, and he doesn't look down on women. He calls us Christians to do the same, to treat people with equality and to live by his spirit and not by religious rules that cultivate sin. This is our spiritual act of worship to love others as Jesus would. That is our spiritual act of worship. 